Good morning, all. Wait, hold on, John. First, I'm going to record, then I'm going to live stream. And there. I thought I are we up? Are we are recording. Almost ready. All right. Okay, go ahead. Good morning, all. Here we are. We Well, yeah, um, John? Muted? No. Oops. Hey, wait, sorry, John. We can't hear you. Oops, wait a minute. Hey, G, why didn't everybody mute except for John? Dean, can you mute? John, can you call the meeting to order? Um, Laura, yes. Oh, I, there you are. I, I, Go ahead. No, Laura, that was me. I just oh, always find it easier if you call in on your phone separately from the computer. From the screen. Um, is anybody else able to hear John? No. No, I can't. No, I can't either. John, no, I can't. Just... You can't either? Okay. John, do you want to try calling in on your cell phone? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Oh, there you are. Yes, but you can everyone hear me or no? Now I can hear you. Dart, can you hear me? This is Clark. I, I just hear heard that, John. I can hear you just a little low. That's all, John. Do you still want me to call in, Laura? Um, it's working now. I'd say go ahead. I don't know what happened before. When, let's try one more time. <laughs> okay, so we're calling the Economic Development, Historic Preservation, and Environmental Conservation Committee to order. It is April 3rd at 8.20 a.m. Can we all check in? So I'll just go down the list. Um, Clark? Here. Yasmin? Here. Here. Right there. Brian? <laughs> Brian, you're muted if you want to say here. Um, Clark? Oh, I already called you. Sorry. Dart? Um, Dennis? I'm here. Jean? Um, if I, I'm calling you and you guys can't speak, it's because you're muted and you have to unmute yourself. That's okay. Uh, John? That's you. Kevin? Here. Paul Briggs? Here. here. And Stan? I'm here. Did I miss anybody? Okay, go ahead, John. Okay, we uh, have the March 6th minutes in my packet. I have had a review, a chance to review them. Are there any changes or amendments to those minutes? <clears throat> Laura, the only thing I had was uh, I, I sent you an email on line 149. There was just a typo. Uh, building inspector, it says R. It's building inspector out on medical leave. That was the only thing, comment I have. Minor thing. Okay, we'll make that change. 149. Otherwise, that looks good, and I'd be glad to make a motion to approve the minutes. 
I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Are there any opposed? The minutes have been approved unanimously. And I will turn it over to Ms. Robertson to talk about stop work order on building permits. Okay, so I put this at the top because it's kind of the biggest thing that's going on in my department right now. Um, the governor issued a direction to us, um, one with his executive order 2202.6, and then with guidance that was issued again on Sunday. And it essentially said that all non-essential construction has to stop. So we put this guidance together for our residents. Um, and it, it says that essentially you, you, all building permits are under stop work order um, unless there's an emergency, like if you have a, you know, your your water line to your house breaks or you've got a project underway that you can't, um, that you can't just stop without it being unsafe. So like you couldn't have like, you know, like something half built that would be an attractive nuisance. Um, so you're allowed to continue until you can bring your project site into a, a place where it is safe and secure. And then essential construction is still allowed to continue. So the governor, you know, defined that as roads, bridges, transit facilities, utilities. Um, so like if there are water line um, upgrades that need to happen or anything along those lines, that's considered essential structure construction, it can still move forward. And then the last exemption that he had put in his guidance is that it doesn't apply to a single worker who is a sole employee worker on a job site. We're still trying to figure that one out a little bit. Um, but essentially, if it's just one contractor, it seems as though they're allowed to be on the site. And then, of course, this does not apply to people who are doing a building permit in their own home without a contractor involved. So if they're taking out their building permit and they're working inside their house, it doesn't apply to them. None of that applies to them. They are under a separate um, kind of thing. This is for contractors. So almost all construction has to stop. You can bring uh, places to a point where they're safe and secure, essential construction continue, and just one person on the job is allowed to work. Um, we Laura, issued there, that guidance. Oh, go a, ahead. There's one that I believe had to stop that I heard about at the Mohawk Golf Club. And I know that I don't think that they're an attractive nuisance as far as the structure is concerned, but unfortunately they have a pool that is now wide open and in disrepair. I don't know if that's the type of thing that would be an attractive nuisance and um, would be a danger. And I mean, that seems kind of vague. I don't know who would, who decides that type of thing. Yeah, it is vague. Um, and right now, like, because the guidance is vague, essentially what we're having people do is fill out the second um, document in your packet, which is the Affidavit of Emergency Essential or Single Workman Project Inspection. So I guess if the Mohawk Golf Club felt like leaving their pool open was attractive nuisance and left liability to them on their property, they could fill out um, the emergency construction and state, you know, what the scope of work was that they felt and what they need, what steps they needed to do on their property to make it so that it wasn't an attractive nuisance. Uh, to complete it. I mean, it may not be that they can finish the project. They may just have to, sure. you know, yeah, whatever. Yeah. So essentially they lay out their plan uh, and they're the ones that are going to make the case that it's a nuisance and they need to fix it. And then we'll review it. If it's, if it seems reasonable, I think we're trying to give, they're the ones signing that they're meeting the gover governor's order. So I think that, you know, we'll reasonably review them. Okay. Um, but essentially, they have to fill it out and present their case to us. And as long as it looks like on the face of it, you know, it's fine. They're the ones that are actually signing it and mm -hmm. still going to the risk. Does that make sense? Yes. And then there might be construction projects that have a lot of material on site. Is that something that would lead to a danger or would they be allowed to work to you know, use those materials on site or they can leave them there as long as they're not a danger to what that probably just kind of fits into the overall attractive nuisance and yeah, dangerous. it would 
It would probably depend on the material. Like if it was piles of dirt, I think they would be allowed to stabilize them like with hay and mulch. Um, but then they would have to leave it because mm -hmm. we have piles of dirt around town that, yeah. you know. How about construction? So, but, but I mean, yeah, like if we're talking like pallets of wood, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it seems like there might be a way to secure those in such a way or take them off the site and store them in some kind of a storage facility so that they wouldn't be at a uh, risk. But I mean, they could still fill out the affidavit mm -hmm. and explain what the, you know, what the steps are that they feel needs to be taken. Like if it's a small step, um, you know, and, you know, it makes sense mm -hmm. regardless of what, exemption they fall under, they still have to maintain their social distances. So even if they're doing essential construction and installing a water line or something, they still need to like stagger their brakes and keep their guys, you know, six feet apart and all sure. the stuff that, you know, applies. So it's, it's still not even going to be that easy to run like essential and emergency construction. Well, I just had a question. How do they, how do they know? There's a lot of building permits out there. How do we see yeah, so Linda and I have been working on an email list to everyone that we're probably going to be sending out today. Um, and we I, we had over 200 open building permits that we're trying to email them that they need to stop work. We also did the email blast to homeowners. So hopefully homeowners um, are also aware and are helping their contractors figure out what their timelines are. But essentially, we're trying to email every single building permit we have. No, thank you. That's, that's good because everybody isn't registered to the website to get the email blast. So, yeah, that's true. Yep. Thank you. All right. What does that bring us to? Um, so our next point is, oops, sorry, I got to scroll back up. I don't have a printer at my house. So that's a big one. If you guys have any questions or hear anything, just reach out to my staff. I know it is... And, and the governor's um, guidance changes a lot, too, so that might end up changing. But Laura, so the resolution Laura this is oh. Paul. I have a quick question. On. I received a call yesterday from someone asking about the sections. Um, a contractor called me about being reported. Um, we mm -hmm. have a section in the notice that if anyone sees anyone um, working, they're to report it to a website. Is that correct? An email. Yeah. Yep. Is that part of the governor's directive to have that that reporting system in place? Um, it is not specifically in his directive, um, but the reason that we put that in there is because um, it's a declared, I think, federal disaster. And so if we can separate the complaints for contractors working um, when they're not supposed to be working under COVID-19 versus the normal stuff they get with our building department, we can separate out those hours and possibly have reimbursement. So we, we created a new email address specifically for like COVID-19 related enforcement problems. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I don't have a babysitter yet. So my daughter's just watching TV. Um. Yeah, and I know that there were some problems with that email uh, yesterday, but it should be up and running today. And I did get some people who had problems with that email and emailed me. So I have received a couple emails that we're following up on. Uh, it it take a little while to get full running on it, but I think we're just trying to do our best to show that we're complying with all of the directives that are coming from New York State. Um, that's what we're doing. So for resolutions, um, we introduced the local law for uh, subdivision fees and site plan applications at the last town board meeting. And it uh, was called for a public hearing. So we have the public hearing set for the end of April. If you guys are comfortable, we could also have the resolution if you wanted to wait. There's not a huge push on this one. We could have the public hearing at the end of April and then take action on it in May. Um, but it's also very small, and we're actually reducing the fees for applications. Um, if you guys remember, like, the sketch plan fee for major subdivision is 200 but for minor, we felt like we could have it be at 100 And also for site plan applications, when there's a big plan that goes through, it's 200 plus a fee for any, you know, square footage of the building. But, like, when we do tenant changes, like when 
you know, Smashburger was moving in or, you know, you know, like Karma Bistro or whatever, they're not changing any site. They're literally just going in and doing a tenant fit up. We felt like it would be fair to just have a tenant change fee that would be $100. So it's a reduction in fee to help, you know, the less complicated projects move forward. So my recommendation would be that we can just do both of them at the end of April. That makes sense. Any okay. thoughts on that? Sounds good. Yeah, that sounds good to me too. Okay. So I'll put so I'll put both of those on for April. Um, we had and and I, I spoke to this in the email that I sent you guys. We had the shade structures and the pesticide free lawn signs on scheduled for the end of um, March, but I haven't been able to finalize them. So I'm leaving them on for April. I would like to get to them. I know we have a we have a draft shade structures plan that is um, I think capable of being in ready for the end of April and the pesticide free lawn sign. I just think that, you know, it's something that is helpful and people would like, and if we can get that out there, it's positive energy to, you know, reduce pesticides. So if I can get it done, I will. And I'd like to leave it on there just in case. Yes, that would be great. Okay. Uh, and then we have our Arbor Day proclamation, which we always do in April. <clears throat> and I have, a, I put it at the end because I have it under Tree Council, but essentially we still want to, a, a lot of places are canceling their Arbor Day, but a lot of things are being canceled. And our Tree Council thought that it might be fun to do a drive through Arbor Day so <laughs> people don't get out of their cars, but they can come and pick up a tree and. Yeah, go ahead. Um, they can come and pick up their car in their cars, the trees, and then go home and plant the trees with their family. And so, you know, they're getting the materials from the town and we could have, yeah, like activity books for kids or, um, you know, little flyers about things you can do to appreciate trees. And they could pick up a, they could pick up a tree and bring it home with their families and then celebrate Arbor Day you know, individually while practicing their social distances. And we thought that might be better than just canceling it or moving it to fall. Because theoretically, everything's fine in the fall. You're going to have so many, like, things going on. Um, so, yeah, so we were thinking a drive through Arbor Day. That's a good idea. Or is that going to comply with the governor's guidelines? It is. Um, it's essentially like curbside pickup of your Arbor Day tree. <laughs> Okay. So nobody's going to be gathering. No gathering. As long as there's no Yeah, gathering. it's not a gathering. Yeah. So it'll be like a take-home Arbor Day. We're essentially going to have like Arbor Day kits that you can pick up at Town Hall and then bring them home with your family. Hi, Laura. Okay. It's Michelle. Hi, Michelle. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. Um, so we're still working on the materials that we would put, um, but I was thinking that probably by the end of today, I'd like to at least do an email blast um, talking about the Arbor Day drive through event. Excellent. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we would do a proclamation for that because we have to as a tree city. Um, and maybe like we can do also something remotely like the day before something where Yasmin reads the proclamation, we could have it on the website. Um, sure. But yeah, we'll make sure that it complies with all the guidelines. We just want people to pick up trees. Yeah. And then I have Earth Day proclamation as a question mark because, oh, sorry, I'm being given stuff to animals. Um, because we usually do an Earth Day. Um, proclamation, but it's often tied with our recycling. And I um, imagine or we're not doing the recycling event this Earth Day. Um, and then I think, I'm sorry, last year for Earth Day, we tied it to something else. I can't remember what it was. Do you guys remember? Um, I don't have Earth Day tied to anything this month. We could still do an Earth Day proclamation and if we could think of something, um, 
it's okay, I think, this year if we don't have it tied to anything, if we just do our Arbor Day proclamation, it's kind of up to you guys. That would work. I don't I don't think it's that vital that we tie Yeah, I mean, I don't, <laughs> because I don't want to just pass an Earth Day proclamation mm -hmm. for the sake of making paper, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Did you have any thoughts, Yasmin, on that one? No, I, I think you're... Your thought process is a good one. I, you know, it's just a unique time, so, so can't do what we do. Okay, and so maybe if we think of an event next April, because Earth Day is always the week before Arbor Day, so it's hard for me to do two events. I usually don't actually do the Earth Day event. I think what we did for Earth Day last year is we planted the chestnuts at the schools. Now that I'm remembering, but the um, yeah, yeah. So obviously the schools right now are closed, so. Right. But potentially next year, if we have Earth Day tied to something, we can do a resolution again. But for this time, we'll just do the, the Arbor Day proclamation we have to do. Yeah, that works. Okay. So um, on to planning board, If I think that's all the resolutions I have. If I have any more, I'll send them to you as early as possible. But planning board has 2538 River Road. Um, the Kelts Farm Average Density Development. We had a lot of discussion, a lot of public comments that were sent to the town board at the town board meeting. Yasmin, I thought you did a really good job reading all of those. I'm glad that it wasn't mm. monotone. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> it was kind of a blessing because you never know who's going to, I thought you did a really good job. There's a lot of them there and I know that you forwarded them on to me. So I'm going to pass them on to the planning board as well. I haven't done that yet, but I will. Um, and I attached the most recent plan, which actually probably I don't even think you've seen, Kevin. I don't know if you noticed. Because yeah, we have no, like you sent to me back or, or Joel sent it a few weeks ago. It's one of okay. Yep. So we actually haven't had a planning board meeting with this plan. This is the plan that was kind of a hybrid between what the county had discussed, which was avoiding um, some of the wetlands, avoiding wetland disturbance, and adding more um, traffic calming, kind of discouraging through traffic by having some really sharp bends or T's in the road. Um, and so this is kind of the most recent update to the plan based on some of the comments that we heard at the public hearing. I mean, we heard a lot of comments that were similar to the town board's comments that, you know, concerns with through traffic. We did also hear some comments in favor of the connection um, which I don't think the town board had heard any of that. Um, so I don't know. What do you guys think of the new plan you want to give? What were some of the comments in favor? I didn't hear any of those at the town board. Well, they weren't at the town board. We did hear, uh, there were, um, I mean, I, I, there was definitely, I have some of the comments in favor even written down and they are for, from people who live like at the end of Briar, Briar. Bridge. Bridge, yeah, um, just generally um, saying that they would like that connectivity to Blatnick Park, you know, um, yeah. Well, There's one of gentleman in the, in the question at the town board wanted to know what the public benefit was of adding that Windsor Drive extension and connecting it. And how would you answer that? Um, so we have um, discussed that at the planning board. Originally, the planning board was looking at only doing um, the bike and pedestrian connection. But as um, a couple members pointed out, Complete Streets actually also is is for cars. So it's to treat cars, bikes, uh, pedestrians and transit equally. And um, you actually would cut down significantly on residents. So they like the, the point is that actually, it's probably not going to be a huge cut through for people who are like coming from Albany and going to Saratoga or that, that, you know, wide swath of north south traffic that we get in this unit. The mm -hmm. benefit of this connection is largely going to be like connecting all of those people that live in Briarwoods, like with Blatnick Park, or connecting all of those people, you know, who live on River Road or Catherine's Woods with Shoprite. So it seemed like it would be a shame when you had that opportunity 
to only connect um, the bicycles and the pedestrians with that benefit. Um, largely the benefit of that connection is going to be for residents who live in the town of Niskayuna. Um, we have asked for a traffic study just to show that, um, but, Laura. But, you know, there are a fair number of people who want to or can't and jump in here, Kevin, like go. Yeah, I, gonna, you know, I got one thing to add, Laura, and you worked on yes. it. So one of the important things of, of positive is emergency response, as stated by the uh, fire chief. Uh, also, I, I assume the police would have the same feeling. If you have an emergency where any of the roads get shut down, you have now an alternate path. And that's uh, actually quicker for emergency response if you need to get over to, you know, Rosendale Road kind of area. So. Yeah, we have an email from the fire chief who said who, who said that it would easily cut off. I mean, he I think he even had a couple minutes in there on uh, rescue times. Hmm. All right. Okay. And we were also, and there was also a benefit of directly connecting Blatnick Park with our town center overlay district. I mean, Blatnick Park's kind of like our flag, our flagship park. We're working on it every day to make it better. And um to have that connection with our town center overlay district and maybe create a green walk, you know, down that bike path so that there's connectivity there um, is also a benefit. Yeah, uh, if I might too, Laura. Laura did a nice job working with the county to come up with the first alternative that we suggested to the applicant. He was a bit resistant at the uh, uh, working session at our last meeting, but it looks like uh, once he sat down with his uh, firm and uh, actually laid it out, it seems to work. Uh, and it also, you know, avoids the wetlands, which is also a benefit, you know, minimizes the impact of the wetlands. All right. Laura, Laura, does the new plan show the connection or not? The new plan that's in the packet, it does still show the connection. It's making it even more, I think we use the word torturous, um, because I think what, you know, what we heard from people is that they don't want this to be a cut through. Um, I mean, interestingly, and this was brought up at the planning board meeting, that up until four or five years ago, they used to paint lines on Windsor Drive, and you can see them in the aerials. They used to have a fog lines and a double uh, yellow line down the middle. And I think that that was just to put people on notice that there was supposed to be a, a big road, and the right-of-way is there as well. Um, and then when we resurfaced it four or five years ago, then the lines didn't go back down. And I mean, you can still see the ride wide, the wide right of way, but unfortunately the lines weren't put back down. Um, but originally it actually was supposed to be a very straight connector road. It, you know, we've got the pushback, things have changed. You heard all their comments in the comprehensive plan. If we make it a torturous route, I think it still serves the neighborhoods and still serves the purpose of, you know, connecting neighborhoods and parks and those kinds of things, but it would hopefully discourage some of the through traffic. Um, so this new um, plan that they have that's attached to your packet has essentially like sort of two very sharp bends in it and you can make them even sharper if you needed to. I like to think, I don't know if anybody ever drives down, like if you go Hetcheltown to Route 50 and then you take a left on, I can't, the sort of end road to Scotchbush and Burnt Hills, there's a really sharp, um, it's almost like a, it's, it could be, you know, a 90 degree angle, but it's not quite. And you have to drive it at like 10 miles an hour. And I think it does slow and discourage traffic. Where is this in, in the planning board stage now? When? So the planning board wanted to have public hearing, heard a lot of comments, wanted to continue the dialogue with the neighbors and so they had initially directed planning staff to set up um, a community forum where we could have the neighbors come in and more informally chat with them about what their concerns were with the connection. That was supposed to be on March 31st, but um, because of the social distancing rules, obviously we didn't move forward with that um, meeting. And we're struggling a little because having it um remotely could work but the whole point of it is to sit around at a table and be looking at people mm -hmm. in the face and having maps in front of you and saying yeah. okay we hear that you don't want this connection because you're concerned about the number of vehicles that are coming like what if we look at it this way like did you think about this and then also we can listen you know there, you know, we feel that there's a lot of benefits to connectivity, good planning, 
um, you know, American Planning Association kind of materials say when you can make these connections, make them. But, you know, it's our town and we have that choice. So we have to listen to, to what they're saying and make sure that it's the best thing. But really just having that dialogue with them mm -hmm. is what the planning board wants to do. And it's a little bit hard right now. So I think we're struggling right now with what the next step is. Okay. Hey, and George, also, like, a lot of developers have put all their stuff on pause. Like, I haven't spoken to Joel specifically, but if the economy really goes down, like, I don't know that we'll see that many houses. I mean, it usually puts a pause on things that are being built. I mean, right now you can't build them anyway. <laughs> but, like, I don't know. It's mm. we're then we really probably need to reach out to Joel and reach out to like Jengis and Kevin can jump in here and figure out how we want to handle our next steps. Yeah, I think we're on pause until um, at least till our next meeting and a working session. We can talk about it. Okay. Makes sense. What's going on at Crescent Ave? Anything? That's probably something still, right? The what was the development that you're asking for? 2220 Crescent Ave. Is that Gail King's? Yeah, project? that one also we're waiting on the engineering. That one actually has much less problems, I think, related to the changes that have been happening with our society, but mm -hmm. we haven't gotten engineering submittals from her. So that one we're just waiting on engineering submittals for her. How about Vincenzo? Vincenzo has submitted drainage studies and a SWIFT. He is theoretically ready to go back to the planning board to take a look at the new information that he submitted. And the next step on that one is to call for a public hearing. So I think the plan is to try and hold the planning board meeting remotely on April 13th. And he would likely be on there for discussion on the new information that we have on drainage. Okay. Clark, and did I that sound about right to you? Yes, he called um, maybe last week or so asking what his next step was, and that's what we agreed on. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, 2764 Choice Connectedy Road is the Aqueduct Animal Hospital. They are just in final engineering. If they can get that to us, they would theoretically be on planning board for final approval. What's going on with the animal hospital on Balltown Road? Mike Pike. Anything? Yeah, I haven't heard from them in a while. Like the last thing that I heard was that they were moving to the professional medical office building kind of across from Stewart's on Riverview Road in mm -hmm. Rexford. And then the planning board had that plan. Um, Kevin, I can't remember what the name of the guy was. He doesn't come before the planning board that often to put um, apartments there. But the density, I think, was just a little bit too much for that section of Walltown Road. So we had reached out to Metroplex and said, is there anything we can do to help this, this property? We would really like to see it, um, you know, turn over and be beneficial to the community. And I believe that they were working together, but that's the last that I heard of it. Okay. Yeah, the goal to make it more conforming, of course. All right. Very good. I think that brings us to 410 Balltown Road. It's not oh, I'm sorry. Can you guys excuse me for one second? No. I have no babysitter this morning. It's all right. Here. Okay. Thank you. Um, it's closed. So, uh, Pier Bar, we talked about before. They, uh, Clark, are they a building permit? They got their planning board approval, right? They did get their planning board approval. And I. I think they did submit for a building permit, but I'm not 100% okay. sure. So they're actually technically a building permit. They probably should have come off the agenda. Vision Works is, is it Vision Works? The, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. the, the Vision company that was in Mohawk Commons moved over to, um, Mansion, to Square. Mansion Square. Okay. And now there's a new, uh, there's a new vision company that wants to go in the old vision works. Is it like America's best or something? America's, oh, thanks, Jeannie. Yeah. Yep. So they, 
um, I think that they are working with us to submit their site plan approval, but essentially it would be a, a vision place going in the old vision works in Mohawk Commons. If they want to move forward, it would be, you know, <clears throat> an eyeglass place, taking an eyeglass place shop and it would make one of our places not vacant. So it just seems like it would be a very easy review and a good thing for the town. Hey, um, Laura, I just want to talk on that. He called this week and he's from like Chicago or something. So I, I know that he is definitely sending either you or Clark like emails, maybe just what they're doing. Okay. From Chicago. I think I actually got his site plan application by email yesterday. So yeah. So if we can move them forward on the 13th, we will as well but they won't fall under the ability. There isn't any way that they could qualify, I don't think, for a building permit. So we can get their planning board approval done, but they're still gonna have to wait for the construction ban to be lifted in New York State. If that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> Dominican retreat we talked about before. I think, Clark, I think they're closer or potentially ready to come to the planning board on April 13th if you know we can get them there. Yeah, I agree. And the JCC signage, we had a, if you guys noticed in the minutes, I know some of you weren't there, but we had a long discussion with the JCC on their electronic signage. And I think where we left it with them was that they needed to submit a site plan application to us that would probably get denied. And they could um, take their, oh no, you know what? I think where we left it with them is they were gonna submit a site plan application and explain how the sign was going to meet the code so they didn't have to get denied. Um, and then they could bring that to the planning board. I have not received anything from them, and it's likely because JCC had to shut down. Um, they shut down in conformance with the school shutting down and some of the other major places of gathering. So I expect that we'll move forward with them at some point, but it's probably going to be later when things start to lift for them, is my guess. I haven't received anything from them. Did anybody have any questions on any of those? Or Kevin, did you have anything to add? Nope, sounds good, Laura. You got it. Thank you. Okay. Um, the zoning board, we canceled it in March. I do not want to cancel it in April. Lynn and I are going to try and use this kind of um, forum for zoning board. We're not exactly how, sure how it's going to work because the public has to present their cases to the zoning board. So maybe we're going to have to um, set up some kind of a pre-meeting with the public to get them all on the you know, and make sure that they can talk so that they can present their cases to the zoning board. Um, but there's some there's some things on there that really shouldn't get pushed off any farther. So we're gonna try and hold the zoning board meeting in April. It is thankfully at the very end of April, April 29th. So what we're telling people now is we're going to have it either remotely or maybe the gathering ban will be lifted or changed in some way by April 29th. Um, but I think we really do wanna hold our zoning board meeting. Quick question, um, chickens. 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 I've been hearing <laughs> rumblings of chickens since I got on the board, I guess, six or seven years ago. Yeah. And the last board mem uh, board meeting kind of brought it up again. And I don't really see the downside to having chickens in this farming town of Niskayuna. What do you got? <laughs> so we have, I made a chicken law modeled after the city of Albany, um, who essentially modeled, I think, keeping four hens in your property. And it says no roosters and you have to have a permit and there's a limited number of permits so that, you know, not everybody in the world has chickens. You have to sort of prove that you're capable of taking care of them. And mm -hmm. they've done it on a trial basis. And as far as I can tell, I haven't heard anything negative. And it was a huge deal in Albany. They tried doing it for 15 years. <laughs> they finally passed it, I think, last year. Um, but actually, and, and and I tell the planning board this too, like our department, Gene can jump in. Like we get calls about chickens like all the time. But um, uh, without but changing our them? code, uh, without changing our code, it's almost impossible to have chickens in this unit. And it was actually brought to the courts and upheld. So our code right now is very strong and enforceable that um, you have to meet certain criteria to have chickens. And I think it's actually two acres. Um, if you don't mind, Laura, could you get a copy of what they're doing in Albany so I can take a look at it? Because I sure. I'm going to talk to the other board members and see if we can't get a resolution on chickens that makes sense. 
But we definitely do have anti-chicken people as well. And the complaints largely come from not taking care of the chickens, like mm -hmm. noise, which is why you say no to roosters. But um, I think I've, we've heard attracting um, things like wolves, or not wolves, coyotes and things yeah. into town. Mm -hmm. um, and also just, you know, if you're not taking care of them very well, like smells. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can regulate that nuisance element with code, but, you know, like right now, how long yeah. have we been so without? I'll chickens? send you. Yeah, I can send you the the code that the planning board has worked on. I mean, Kevin, you can jump in. The planning board's actually been working on a chicken code for three yeah. years. Yep, yeah, I think the the planning board, just from conversation, seems to be sort of split on it. Also, oh, shit. Um, for the same concerns, yeah. you know, um, uh, we're hearing both uh, pros and cons for it. Uh, but I, yeah, I think I, that where, where you left off was that you talked about. Uh, Possibly putting something on the, um, the website where you could get some feedback. Um, uh, remember, there was like going to be an email blast uh, asking for input. It's kind of like a, a poll on chickens. Yeah, like Denise know. wanted to send out a thing basically asking town residents if they would support a chicken ordinance um, and just see where that landed. Because we did get a lot of responses on the farmer's market. I think they want to do something like reach out to the whole town. It is kind of a family thing you know with moms and dads and kids and uh, chickens and it, it gives uh it's kind of like a, a nice family activity and we are a farming community at least we used to be we're not we used to now, be. but when did yeah. we when did we put something in saying you couldn't have chickens or did we do there that? there was an incident several um years ago and i think it was probably like early thousands 2000s and there were some people that had chickens in the apartment buildings and that raised the complaint and i remember that sort of pushed the initiative to put the chicken ban in the town and i remember looking at it at the cac and we were very split about it um you know it was not unanimous that we should ban chickens at all i think people mm. were very split on it but it did mm -hmm. go through it's, well it's maybe we can take another right. look at it Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I'm in favor of it if we do it well. The planning board knows that. That's why I keep bringing it back. But it definitely does have um, people who are opposed to it. And it definitely, right now, the law is very clear on our ordinance. If we change it, um, we open up, you know, mm -hmm. you no know, litigation potentially. So um, if we change our code? Well, yeah. So, like right now, essentially, our code on chickens has been vetted to a very high level of courts. If once we change it, then you know it's we're good. You know. So I, I just remember Matt Miller was like, "Don't touch that law, Laura." Okay. <laughs> but I mean, I I feel like if you do it well and you and you limit mm -hmm. the number of hens and no roosters and you know and if it is a nuisance you put in the enforcement of course it's more work for my department but it does allow people to have some say over the type of food and things mm -hmm. that they grow so. and heck if albany a city like albany can do it it should be doable here in a town in this Cuyuna. yeah i would and you and you and if you know somebody in albany like feel free to reach out to them like i talked to them about it there's a couple people who who work that through and it had take it took a long time, like eight to ten years down in Albany. But the the last push, they had almost no resistance on it. So, oh, all right. That's okay. the largest model of is the Albany one. Chickens. What else? Okay. Good. Grants update. Um, you guys, I saw that you know the the award for the docks was um was voted in favor at the last town board meeting. So. Um, Barnum and Judas is working on preparing the contract documents for Pollard on that. And um, again, like we'll have to see how the construction, you know, ban applies and unfolds. But theoretically, we'd want to get working on that as soon as we can. Um, Wesson and Samson, I attached their quote for the bike ped crossings. So that's the grant where we wanted to put the blinking lights to cross it from River Street at St. Joseph's um, to Cross Knot Street at Regent. And, um, you know, we may be able to remove the one related to Kelts Farm because he would theoretically be moving the one uh, where you cross from Riverdale to uh, Rosendale Road. Or, sorry, Riverdale, you cross River Road from Riverdale <laughs> over to Park. So those are the three crosswalks. And a sidewalk that they're talking about engineering that's to do the connection on Knot Street of the sidewalk. 
Um, I think I want to move forward with the with that grant. I think it's a good grant. Um, I just want the engineering department to look at that. And I know that Matt cut his hand on some glass this morning and isn't able to attend. Um, so I think unless you guys have thoughts on it, I will send it over to engineering and get their thoughts on it. Um, and, yeah, that'd be that, that'd be great. Okay. And then the other one is the Upper Union Street plans. I can email them to everybody. I have construction drawings to do the crosswalk between St. Cattery and um, uh, the um, Brookdale Apartments there on Upper Union Street. And it uh, creates an island and adds some landscaping and kind of an entrance to Upper Union Street. Mm -hmm. So I would at some point like to move forward with that. I just need people to look at it and be like, this is okay. <laughs> Maybe okay. I'll just be sending out to everybody. Yeah, that'd be good. Um, complete streets. We did cancel, and most of this is just we did not have a lot of time to talk at our last meeting. Um, complete streets. I know the school did vote on changing their school configuration, so and we have uh, talked about them before. And I thought that like Brian and Rosemary were really helpful and we were listening a lot to our ideas, but with the change in configuration on the schools, we just wanted to make sure that the that some bike ped connections were um, included in the bonding to mitigate some of the traffic impacts of that new configuration. It seemed like they were open to it and I don't know, maybe Brian, well, it, it's probably not appropriate, but I don't know. Their timeline for when they need, you know, to kind of decide on those things, I don't know, but Complete Streets has been, I thought, working really hard on it and it's been a positive. So I think that we just need to finalize now what bike ped connections we want to prioritize asking the school for just to mitigate some of the changes in traffic patterns. Um, I have a bike festival still planned, but I would think that that would have to be probably at a minimum in the fall and potentially we might want to push that off to next year. I'm just going to leave that on there now while we're talking about it. We were able to get 2020 paving um, recommendations over to the highway department pretty quickly after we had uh, the highways meeting and hopefully they're able to take some of that into account. I thought it was the first time that we've really done that in the right time. And so I, that was a positive and I appreciate the highway department and the um, and the highway committee working with us on that. And then I haven't moved forward on this, but I don't wanna take it off the agenda because I think it's really important. I would like to just reach out to MJ Engineering or someone to figure out how to get that a push button on Flower Hill so that it's not blinking 24 seven. Yeah. That would be great. Um, Tree Council, we talked about this, a drive through Arbor Day event on April 25th. Hopefully we can do a blast later today. Yasmin, if you don't mind um, keeping the email open and taking a look at the blast maybe this afternoon. Yep, that sounds good. And, and then um, I did see, I think in Ray's update or someone's update that they're planting spring trees, which is great. Uh, I haven't had a chance to coordinate too much with Highway um, but if they're out there planting trees, it's only a good thing. And I just want to thank them for that. I know we ordered a lot of them in the fall. So I'm happy to hear that they are planting some this spring. And hopefully that's going well. Um, again, Conservation Advisory Council working on the pesticide outreach lawn sign policy. The community choice aggregation, we talked about this at the last meeting. But because we canceled our CAC meeting, we haven't kind of finalized the ESCO letter that is kind of warning people that there's predatory ESCOs out there that may take advantage of the fact that we're moving forward with our CCA. And so we just want to maybe send out notification to people to just pause when they could get those in the mail and just um, maybe wait on signing contracts that lock them in for a year, you know, because we might be able to offer them a better rate in a couple months. So hmm. that's just something that we want to do if we can. And then I think I just brushed through this before. But I, and Paul Briggs and um, Alexis probably would be the ones to weigh in. But when we were having that um, conversation with Mega on when we get, they're going out to bid to get these rates. When those rates come back in, they only hold them for like, I think they said 48 or 72 hours. 
So we either have, and we will have those thresholds ahead of time, but we either, you know, authorize Yasmin to take action within that time frame under, you know, certain thresholds, or we, um, or we know that time period and we call a special meeting during that time period just to take action on the contract. I believe that we were leaning towards the first option. First option, okay. It wasn't in the minutes, <laughs> so I left it in there. So the first option would be authorized assessment under some type of like threshold. Okay, so that'll probably not be in April. I think it'll probably more be like May or June, but that'll eventually then have to be a resolution. Okay. Um, Climate Smart Task Force, we missed the April submittal, and that was just due to all the COVID stuff and working from home, and I am sad about that, but our final submittal deadline is July 3rd, and so essentially we're just going to start submitting stuff all the way up to that point, and hopefully still get certified um, as Climate Smart, uh, as a Climate Smart community for 2020. So we have till July 3rd, and I think It'll just be a rolling submission. As soon as we get stuff done, we're just going to start submitting it. Um, any, and then, I, oh, go ahead. Any, is there anything uh, important that we need to do before that date? P possibly. What I want to try and do for the, our first certification is certify is complete everything that we have done so far. But the second item in there is, I would say, one of the things that the Climate Smart Communities Task Force has liked would like to see and will earn, earn us points is expanding our composting program. Mm. Um, and I've heard that from residents outside of the Climate Smart Communities Task Force. We've had a couple people come to CAC as well and ask us about composting. I am not, a, I have my own little tiny compost pile in my yard, but I'm not a super composting expert, but I do think that it's possible for the town to do it in some way and then offer, I mean, it's kind of a benefit. Like I think the residents bring their, um, scraps and then eventually can pick up soil like i think is beneficial to everyone um and i would think maybe not too much more work because we're already collecting the leaves so we have like half of the compost pile already um but i i don't know i would like to look into that more that's something that the town would have to do don't you dump food and everything and coffee grounds in the compost yeah, coffee pile? Grounds. i mean do you do, who does all that well so that I, neighbors? I know that in my own pile, like I don't put, well, I'm a vegetarian. But I don't, you're not supposed to put meat or cheese or dairy products because um, it attracts, you know, in your own right. house. But like other people have told me, like when it's a municipal composting program, <laughs> I mean, you, need to, you can't put like plastics or like, right. you know, but you can essentially, Everything. I think put a lot of food waste in there, mix it all with the leaves and turn it, and then it turns into soil, you know. So the idea would be have a big space and then the community could drive up, put their car. Maybe you could add like a transfer in. station bin. Matt's not on the call, but maybe you can add like a transfer station bin where people dump their compostable materials and then, Get you know, the transfer station guys take it over to our, where we collect leaves and, mm -hmm you know, they get trained on composting and then they can mix the two of them together. I mean, I don't know, right. <laughs> but it, it seems to me like it might work. Um, you know, the transportation's right there. The leaf piles are like right there. If you start collecting scraps and you put them together, theoretically you can make, you know, things that would help people. And we're talking about chickens and things and ways for people to, you know, if we reduce waste and give so people what the ability. That, then what happens to the compost? Yeah, I mean, you mix it with the leaves and then the scraps and then you turn it and with heat or I think because ours would probably just be heat. Um, it breaks everything down and then you turn it some more and it turns into soil. And my understanding is with um, it, it turns into compost is, you know, the, the communities that have these successful municipal composting programs, a lot of them are places where the municipality does the trash. So they'll have a bin for trash, they'll have a bin for recycling, and then they'll have a bin for compost. And the municipality is picking up the compost at people's houses. I don't know that we can do that because we don't pick up people's trash. Okay, but, but then what does the municipality do with the compost? If people yeah, come and so take you the mix soil it with the leaves, yeah, and then 
And then it's offered as a service to the community, I think for free, that they can go and pick up compost for their gar gardens. And I mean, that's great stuff. You can grow anything in it. It's really, really good. Um, hey, Laura. You're taking yeah. Um, don't we have Portia that that's what she does like for a living? And she talked about the task force, right? About how to do that. Of course, yeah. And she has said that like we already actually compost with our leaves. So she doesn't think that it needs to be that much more of a step to do um, like food scrap composting. The thing that we have to figure out is like, you know, is the town going to be picking up compost bins at, at the end of people's driveways? Like, I don't know. That seems like a pretty big lift right now. But um, even if we just offer a place for people to bring their compost scraps, I'm not sure. You uh -huh. can. There are residents in this unit right now who have contracted services with composting companies, and they do put compost bins at the end of their driveway and get them picked up. Mm -hmm. um, they're paying for that service um, because they, you know, it's environmental and you're reducing your waste stream. So there's not a lot of them that do that, but there are residents in town right now that have compost bins at compost bins that they put at the end of their driveway that get picked up. By who? Composting companies. Oh. So what's the next step in this composting program? Uh, well, we can reach out to Portia, and I do think there was someone at the town board level that was interested in composting, or maybe it was nearby the town board level, um, and just get all the people who are interested and willing to work on it in a room. I mean, I think Ray has to be there, because I mm -hmm. don't 100% understand how the leaves work, and obviously all the work would very likely fall on Ray or Matt's yeah. department. I agree. <laughs> So can't be just the Laura idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think we need to get all the people in the room and see, like, is it feasible? So, like, maybe I, I, could, I could schedule the composting meeting and then everybody could be like, what's wrong with you? But Okay. <laughs> all righty. Architectural. No, Climate Smart Communities Task Force. We did Architectural Review Board. Yeah, Claire, can you take this one? You've been working really hard on it. Sure, okay. Um, really, Dave Garpino has been helping steer us a little bit, just get an architectural review board up and running. So he had a couple towns that he suggested we research, Saratoga, Casanova, New York, and New Rochelle, and I think Colony to an extent also. So I've been doing a little checking, searching on those, and it definitely seems like something that would be very useful. The, we're looking at other communities just to get a feel for how detailed and kind of restrictive in a way some of them are versus others being a little bit more lenient. The idea for NISCUNA would be to really be able to provide some free guidance to people when they're doing something like an addition to their home or making some type of change to help them preserve their property value by doing those additions in architecturally in a way that would be consistent with the home and the homes around them. So some of these, like Saratoga has a very, very detailed program um, with design guides and aids right on their website, right down to what color paint they would recommend or maybe even require. Dave is not thinking you know, anywhere near that restrictive. It would really be more in the category of free architectural type um, advice to homeowners to help them preserve their property values. So where are we along in the process? Uh, so we yeah, have so a are... summary being put together right now of um, what other architectural review boards look like for some similar communities that that's what i've been working on okay yeah, and we had a successful first meeting in person actually with all three of our members of our architectural review board and david and clark and myself and i mean everybody seemed really excited but it did feel like we needed a little more definition of what we needed to do and how it was going to work between building department and planning board and all of the different places and how we would regularly meet and then, like Clark said, like having these design guidelines available um, for both the architectural review board to work off and use when they're reviewing stuff, and also for 
people to know up front, which would hopefully help guide projects before they even needed to come to the architectural review board. Does that sound about right, Clark? Yes, yes. At, at the first meeting, there was a little talk about what would the next steps be, and one of them was an email blast just to say that the architectural review board now exists, yep. and then to pick a project or two kind of as a straw man to get started on, and even the Ace Hardware on Balltown Road mm -hmm. with their greenhouse was recommended as, a, as an initial project just to help maintain the look of that property. Excellent. So um, on the building department enforcement side, uh, aside from the stop work order, the town-wide stop work order that is keeping us busy, um, we are still trying to review building permits. Um, we're not going to issue them under the stop work order unless they qualify for an exemption, but we can have them in the queue so that when things um, get better, they can be released that day. So rather than us just having a huge pile to start from, we'll have the pile essentially done and then it'll just be people picking them up. So um, if people have projects that they still do want to move forward with, even though they can't get a building per permit for this, they can submit them to us electronically and we still are reviewing them. Um, we're also still following up on complaints and we're also still following up on some things that can be done without our building inspectors interacting with anyone. So like, um, like solar panels on roofs and in some cases, like siding, things where, you know, it's it's like outside of the house and you don't really have to go in. We're still undertaking some inspections like that. And then we're also offering, uh, you know, for projects that are essential or do qualify for an exemption that they can hire their own architect or engineer and they can submit those inspections to us via email and we can improve them or say go back and take a look at something for us and um <laughs> i mean there is a it's not a lot but there are a number of homeowners that are working inside their home and can continue to work and we're also thinking about doing some virtual inspections with them so to the extent that we can we're still trying to offer all our services i just i think my staff has been incredible during this time and i do want to say like they're just figuring it out and being really helpful and working remotely and coming in the office when needed and, you know, keeping each other going. And I just feel like we just have an amazing building planning department and I'm very proud of them. They've only been helpful <laughs> this whole time. But we did also have, um, we had some remote training on our fire inspection software and I thought that went really well. Um, so the modules installed and during the training, we uh, said, okay, that's not going to work for us. Can you add this? Can you do that? So he's got a bunch of stuff that he's working on for us. And he's going to make those updates to the fire inspection software and get it back to us. But the silver lining of, you know, kind of having us be working remotely is that we're working on things like this so we can make our software work better. We can update our websites. We can do things that will make everything work better when we when we all come back together and start moving forward again. So I think it's, you know, my team has been good at finding ways to make things work positively and like getting the fire inspection software and stuff going has been one of the things that is a lot of work and we're able to do right now. That's excellent, Laura. How is uh, the highway department doing with work? Are they taking out single cars? Or are they generally, they got to go out um, twos, don't they? I don't know. I mean, Yasmin, do you know how they're working? Yeah, the highway department is still maintaining essential functions. So um, I know they were pretty busy earlier in the week, or maybe it was last week. I've lost tons of time at this point uh, when we had that snowstorm. So they're out doing that. Um, they have called back um, their parks department now has been deemed essential um, to get the uh, lawn and leaf um, yard waste pickup up and going, and that's going to start uh, next week. Um, and they do have to start getting, you know, the parks ready to open for the summer, um, as we're hoping eventually current circumstances are uh, going to be changing, hopefully for the better soon, sooner than later. So mm -hmm. they are going to be um, beginning to start work to get everything ready for the season. 
So they are working, but kind of keeping the social distance. I mean, you know, like, can you have yeah. two people in the same truck? You know, can you do that right now or no? I don't know. If they can avoid it, they are not. So they are at, um, we have told them that if at all possible that they can maintain the same 50% uh, remote work um, mandate that we're all under. Okay. Um, so to the degree in which they can comply with that, um, they have been. Um, when they're working outside, they can maintain a safe distance. But you're right, when they're you know in a vehicle mm -hmm. together, unless, it's for snow plowing where you have to have two people in tandem. Um, they're trying to just be by themselves doing work as much as possible. Okay. Excellent. And is there anything else that we need to talk about? So I just have on your planning department, I was kind of received a, onslaught of emails about webinars to maintain uh, my planning certification and my floodplain manager certification. And I thought that was a great use of also working from home time to do all these webinars, although it ends up being so busy that it's almost hard to still fit the webinar. <laughs> but I took a really good course um, yesterday and on Tuesday about higher standards for subdivision development to mitigate flooding. And it was very interesting because it was talking about how a lot of flooding issues don't necessarily happen in the floodplain, which any floodplain manager knows, but it was talking about putting stuff in your flood, in your subdivision code to study um, streams that are unmapped and study um, areas of flooding that are known. And I think there's a lot of stuff in there that is very relevant to NISCUNA because Kevin and Dart can certainly chime in, but I would say that the largest comments and issues that we have when we're looking at subdividing land is usually drainage. A mm -hmm. lot of the land that's left is a lot of the land that was developed was developed, you know, maybe before uh, a lot of flood regulations or, you know, pushed the water into the land that's left. And so when the land that's left is being developed, it's very scary for people because it's like, where's the water going to go? Um, and a lot of the higher standards for subdivision regulation are essentially if it's wet, don't touch it, <laughs> work around it, um, which was why it was nice to see on the Celts farm that there's a way to put that in without disturbing the wetlands. Um, and um, some of it, if you codify it, um, they were talking about, you know, that the subdivision code regulations do hold up in court because you're protecting public health and safety. And uh, I mean, I think a lot of it is really good. So if I have some time, I'll probably put it together and maybe bring the list to you guys or the planning board, I was very happy to see that I would say at least 50% of it was already in our code. And there's just some other things that we could do that will help. But like having a buffer to wetlands is a really big deal. And we already have that. Having a buffer to streams is a really big deal. And we already have that. Um, and I think our buffer was right in line with what they were recommending on streams. Um, but studying some stuff and um, avoiding some stuff we could probably go a little bit stronger in our subdivision code okay and then clerk has been uh, working on updating our planning farms which is great like i said like my staff's been great and they're figuring out stuff that we can do from home that's just going to make everything better when we go back to work so that's great i always have a section for paul paul do you have any legal things that you wanted to talk about i do not thank you Okay, and then Dennis, I maybe I should put you at the beginning. <laughs> Did you have anything that you wanted to talk about? No, that's all right. Um, the only thing I'll mention is that uh, the the grant we applied for was approved for uh, a historical sign at the at the uh, Rosendale Common School, and uh, filled out extra paperwork, and uh, supposedly the check will be on its way soon. So, um, what grant was that for? Side where the where the sign will go in front of the school. I don't know where the planning board or Laurel would have to figure out where to put it. All right. Is there um, anything further for the good of the order? Dennis, uh, I, I can work. I was just going to say, I always want to thank Laura Robinson and Bill Lawrence for their hard work. Uh, this is great. <laughs> uh, it went great today. And, uh, uh, you know, keeping things moving forward. I appreciate it. I agree. Yep. Thank you all. And if there is nothing further, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. 
Motion to adjourn. All second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank you again, Laura. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank Bye -bye. you. Okay. All right. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. See you later.